It's as simple as this. I like to say, as I say at the end, to be or not to be, what does that really mean? He's simply saying he, he's an enlightened being. I mean, there's no doubt that the, the man who was the true author is in that state of consciousness. I would, I would hazard a guess to say it's cosmic consciousness. He's, he's an avatar. He's a great master and he came to deliver this truth. But he's saying to be or not to be, we have a choice always to be or not to be who we truly are. You can be the I am that I am, or you can keep on wearing this mask and play all the roles you want. You can incarnate thousands, millions of times if you want and just, just be in the drama. And, that, and that's fine too. I like that. I wrote all these dramas. It's fine. We have an eternity to live in, you know, but you can be that or you can choose to take off this, this communal mask of a Midsummer Night's Dream that we're all living, take it off and be who you truly are. So to be who you really are or not to be, that is the question. <laughs>
kids, at least I felt this when I was a child, I thought I was invincible and that I could do anything. And it just, but I think that's a normal uh, f feeling for most children who are just fresh in from the astral, right? You've just, you've just incarnated mm -hmm. where you can just go manifest, manifest, manifest. You, you make things apparently, uh, you can just make anything happen where you just came from. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you begin to sort of be able to operate this meat body, I think there's still a memory of that. And I can, I can remember just feeling, oh, I can do anything. Uh, and, and that just felt very normal. Of course, you then get a lot of negative input from the environment and friends and family, etc. Not, you know, all well-meaning, perhaps, but still, mm -hmm. don't do this, don't do that. No, 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 you hear. So uh, but as I went into teenage life and deciding to get away from Manchester, um, it seems as though I just remembered a manifesting system that I must have just brought with me from a past life. It it was very clear. I knew exactly what to do. And I'm going to show you that system because I feel it's really uh, useful to share. If anybody uh, wants to try to adopt it for themselves, please go ahead. I have a lot of graphics on it, so we're going to share a screen on that. But just let me tell awesome. you, background wise, I was studying uh, classical piano for nine years first. But um, I, I loved jazz most most of all. And of course, the Beatles were happening at the time that I was growing up. And so I wanted to, to, to be in that world as well. I wanted to be the next Beatles. Just about every kid that, that played anything did. You know, that was the that was the goal. And <clears throat> I remember coming home from school. Well, it was just after school, really. Uh, the year would have been 66 um, when the monkeys came on TV. And so I'm looking on our little black and white television. Uh, any of you remember that? You probably don't even remember what televisions are, but they they were these curious boxes. They were big. <laughs> stare at. They were very big and boxy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, black and white. And on comes this 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 pop group called the Monkeys, and and at least I know that even young people today have still heard "Hey Hey with the Monkeys." That's right. right. At least they've heard uh, that song. <laughs> and I saw her face. I'm a believer. You know, these are the the hit mm -hmm. records of the Monkeys in 1966. They had it, it seems incredible, but they sold more records than the Beatles and Elvis combined in 1966. Wow, I didn't know that. And that's a fact that I, I put into a book I wrote later uh, called They Made a Monkey Out of Me, which you'll hear, which we'll get to. But the bottom line was I had this curious reaction to the monkeys. Uh, as soon as I saw Davy Jones, who was one of the members of the monkeys and perhaps the most uh, the most famous and certainly the cutest. If you were to compare it to the Beatles, he was he was McCartney. You know, <laughs> he, he was the cute one that got all the girls and, he, and in each episode stars came out of his eyes and he fell in love with somebody you know um he was from manchester from around the corner from where i was i didn't know him uh but he had got this gig and the moment i saw him on television my stomach churned with pain and i utterly hated him and I couldn't wow. explain why there was no rational reason. I didn't know him, but I had this absolute visceral reaction, which at first I just put down to, well, it was jealousy, of course. Like he's got yeah. the gig I wanted. How come he got it? You know, I wasn't old enough to be out there yet doing that, but I, I was, I was upset, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's preamble to what comes later. I just saw this guy and I, I just tuned it out. I thought, I don't want to see this, this show. I hate this guy. No reason at all. <laughs> mm. So now I go out into the world and um, first of all, as I, I was at the Royal College of Music. Uh, I got a, a, a sort of a, what do they call it? Uh, well, a, f a free pass, I suppose. I can't even. Scholarship, yeah. In, in England, a scholarship to go along. Um, but I didn't last long because it was classical music and they had no tolerance at all for jazz. I remember going in one day mm. to my professor and saying, so excited, I'm going to see 
Duke Ellington tonight at the Free Trade Hall. And my my professor literally did this. He went, oh, really? <laughs> sort of like, why on earth would you do that? It was really awful. It was prejudice on every level, uh, mm. of course, against the music, race, racial prejudice, everything. So I thought, oh, I'm not going to last long here. So I just left. I did not even complete my first year. And I went to sort of despite them, I, I went to Africa with a jazz band. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Well. So yeah. I, I went to Africa and that gave me a, that gave me uh, the the impetus and the, the taste for travel. I thought, oh, this is great. I would love to travel. Uh, but anyway, so I get back. I'm playing in a jazz club in England and I get this idea. I would love to get a gig on a cruise ship. That was my goal because I thought you can... Oh, you travel the world, save all your money, mm. uh, get to see the entire world. So all I knew about how to manifest was that you had to think positively, more positively than negatively. Obviously, everybody knows that. I'd read a few mm -hmm. books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill's book, mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie's book. But yes. I didn't know how to meditate. But I just assumed that if I got a picture of a cruise ship and I stuck it up on my wall and I focused on it every morning and every night, and if I could really literally focus my mind to believe I was already on it, see it. Yes. See the palm trees, see the blue ocean, see the sand, see myself at a grand piano, surrounded by beautiful women, of course. And, and you know, and just show you off. I mean, that's, you just, oh, I can see it, I can see it, I can see it. I was, I was 19, you know, I was 19, yeah. 19, 20. So that's what I did. So can I share a screen and now show you how I used this system? And I called the system at the time the missing eye. Well, no, let me correct myself on that. I didn't call it anything at the time. I'm calling later the missing eye because yeah. there's a connection to it that makes sense much, much, much later. But at the time, I just, I just went, this is how you do it. You stick a picture on your wall of a 100,000 ton luxury cruise liner and you focus <laughs> on it. And that's what I did. So I put this picture on my wall and looked at it every day. Now, my middle name is William, and I never liked mm -hmm. that name for whatever reason until I realized that really it's an anagram of I am will, the very, uh, mm. very functioning catalyst of the entire universe, willpower. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, OK, I, I understand that. I have tremendous willpower. I can make this happen. And the way I envisioned it was I, this, as I say, this must have come from a past life that I just understood. I would draw a line that is the timeline going from now to the right like that, draw a circle and a target on it. Top is positive thoughts, 100 percent positive thoughts down here is no, no, no positive thoughts at all. Negative. Hmm. And 50 50. And I knew that if I looked at this picture on my wall and I focused very intently on, I see it, I can, I'm on there, right? But then when you come away from your so-called meditation, what happens? The, the, the negative thoughts pile in. Who do you think you are? You're just a, you know, mm -hmm. just a little kid from Manchester. How are you going to get on a ship? You don't know any, you have no contacts. You know, who do you think you are? And so it was very, it was self-evident to me that if you thought 50% positive and 50% of the time you're thinking negative at the end of the day, where are you going to be? You mean, right where you place. started. <laughs> you've just, you've, you've attracted it right with a certain number of positive thoughts and you've repelled it with a certain number of positive right. thoughts that just made perfect sense. But the idea of having a visual is what helped me focus on why such a thing would, would work. Cause I could see it was scientific. And this is something that I've never seen in any other system. The, the, my system is the same as any other system in, in, in terms of saying outweigh your positive, your negative with your positive and get more and more positive and be vigilant about checking your negative thoughts. When you have a negative mm. thought and you see it, counteract it with two positive thoughts. Say, no, I'm not accepting that. I am there. Mm. I see it. So, so obviously scientific. 
if you're thinking 75% positive and only 25% negative, it seemed to me you're going to manifest by drawing a line down there and you will manifest that thing there. I don't know how long that is along the timeline. It might be a year. It might be a week. It might be longer. I've got no idea how long that is. But I do know it makes sense that if I can really ramp up my positivity to 90, 10, I'm going to manifest it there. Make sense to everybody? Mm hmm. Yeah. Along the timeline. It's just simple math. Whereas if you're only thinking 60, 40, it's going to be there. So I set yeah. about doing this morning and night, looking at this picture and trying to get my balance way up into the 90 to 95 percent and that takes vigilance it just takes listening mm -hmm. once you're not doing this focused meditation uh, you have to watch your thoughts you know that's all oh i mm -hmm. thought a negative thought there counteracted all right so i was keeping my thoughts in this range of 90 to 95 percent knowing it's going to come now there is something curious about that that what what if this is a true system what does this mean a hundred percent that would mean you would manifest when? <laughs> in, now. In, almost instantaneously, if you will. I mean, all. Yeah. Well, when, no, there's no almost. For, for everyone it. listening to, for everyone listening, we're looking at a perfect circle that resembles right now a bullseye. And and what Alan has been showing us is a little bit of um, it almost. I mean, it looks like geometry, but he's taking the curve and he's shortening it, you know, a, as it would be in, in reality, as we became, you know, more of a master manifester, as we became conscious of our unconscious thoughts and started to really become, you know, the, the master of them and, and people who do this. And I talk about this all the time. For those of you who listen to me, you know, the, the, the more consistent you are, the faster things are going to show up for you and you're going to find that across the board. And so we've been just looking at this wonderful little chart that Alan made for everyone okay. who's only got the audio. Oh, I see. Sorry, so, but you will, you, this will be shown on video. Yes. It's, yes. Everyone watching on YouTube and rumble will, will be able to see this. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks for explaining. I wasn't aware of that. So, but that point, that's the point. So yes, it's only different from other systems in the fact that it gives you a visual to concentrate on. And no doubt um, Faust will make this vis uh, this visual thing yes. available as well, even in just a picture for those who want it, because I would really like you to to actually use this system yourselves, because I'm going to show you how precise it is and how reliable. So anyway, the 100 percent then leaves you with a line going straight down to now, which sounds kind of well, that sounds biblical. That, that sounds like if, yeah, be, it sounds if miraculous. you can believe it is done, said Jesus and probably all the other great masters that have ever mm -hmm. come to earth. But that does not really represent our human state, doesn't it? We, we almost cannot believe that. And yet I, start, I set about proving that the system works by pushing my positivity towards the 90 to 95 percent mark. And so you'll you'll find out as this is going that I, I well there is a there is a there is a situation where 100 percent actually works which we're getting to but for mm -hmm. now i'm looking at i can i can manage my thoughts in that area i was very good at it and so what happened was all of a sudden after about i think it was like two months i got a call from a complete stranger he says i hear you're a really good piano player and i said very humbly yes <laughs> I am, because <laughs> I was. And I was playing in all yeah. kinds of jazz clubs and stuff, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, just twenty years old. And he says, "Well, would you like a gig on a cruise ship?" I went, yeah. oh, "Wow!" And I go, "Yeah." What he I says, ever? He says, "My my piano player just died in a, in a pub fight." So I went, wow. "Yes." Oh no. <laughs> oh no wow like oh did i oh. cause that <laughs> yeah oh my god okay. wow but i was off and running i mean it was it was just like that it was like oh my god i've got a gig on a cruise ship and i went and there oh, i was and i'm out on this cruise ship and it worked and so 
you've got all kind of fireworks going off in the in the mind you mm -hmm. know like oh this is how it works now i have to tell you it was a fun it was a fun gig uh, mostly in the bahamas and everything i envisioned came true you know the palm trees the sea mm -hmm. the beach and the girls around the piano so yes. because that's what I had thought and that's what I wanted and that's what I envisioned. And it was there. And of course, I'm just a young kid and I'm having a, I'm having a blast and it's just great to be out. Oh, it's great to be out of Manchester. I'll tell you that. So, yeah. <laughs> so one particular trip where we are sailing to Bermuda and we are the weather forecast says, oh, you're going to have to go through a, a, a hurricane. Oh, wow. And you've got no chance on a ship of of going around it because they'll miss all the, right. the you know, they're not oh, going to get back to port in time. So you've either got to abandon the cruise and lose all of that or go through it. So they decide to go through it. And I'm on the, uh, the ship is literally tossing up and down like this. And everybody's oh, at the low decks throwing up. And I was doing my best Captain Dan from Forrest Gump that had not even happened yet. I'm on, I'm on the front of the ship going, you call this a storm. I was having <laughs> a blast. I'm going, oh, my God, I can feel the power of the universe. Yeah. It was tossing this 100,000 ton cruise ship around like a toothpick in a bathtub. And it was literally in the center of a gigantic hurricane. Wow. And it just struck me. This is the power of the universe. It's the same power at whatever level, down at electrons or in galaxies. It mm. is the power that is that you're tapping into by this manifesting. And so it just thrilled me. And I, I, I set about being even more uh, determined to manifest. So when I got back from my couple of years on that ship, I started, I was writing songs by now and singing as well as playing piano. And of course, the, the memory came up. I want to be the next Beatles. And I hate that Davy Jones guy. I'm going to beat him. I'm going to, I'm going to have some hit records. <laughs> so I start deciding I'm going to manifest a record deal. Same method. Just imagine it in your mind. See yourself signing a contract. See yourself in the studio with the microphone mm -hmm. and the engineering booth and and the record sales. And, you know, just envision it. And within now, within, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it was about seven months, I, mm -hmm. I get a record deal. I, I'm drawn to the attention of Charisma Records label it was hmm. monty python's record label oh, wow. um, now they end up having what they called image meetings and every couple of months oh, they'd, yeah. have drive, they'd have me drive down from manchester to london for an image meeting oh boy now we're going to do this album i'm recording this album this year and it's going to be called the jazz pianist and there's me how i looked back <laughs> Yes, and I see goes, I see you. And they say, your name is, and I'm, you know, this big oak desk with all the suits around. And these are the people that decide your future and how to market and right. promote what you're doing. And they said, your name is Tommy Blue. And I go, no, <laughs> no, no, it's Alan Green. No, it's Tommy Blue. And guess what? <laughs> You always wear blue, even on the radio. <laughs> oh my God. I'm serious. I mean, I, what I'm telling you here is not a not a word of exaggeration. No, I know. I was I, I was in the, a similar business, but I know how they right. do it. Yeah, I had. So then, and they buy me a wardrobe of all blue, everything blue. Oh my God. But two months later, they call me down for another image meeting. Forget Tommy Blue. Your name is Tommy Rainbow. Oh, you've got to be kidding. What? <laughs> My God. And a couple of months later, forget Tommy Rainbow, your name's Jimmy Bow. And then it's Jack Bow. And then it's Mad Jack. I'm serious. Mad, Mad and they, they they're telling me, Mad Jack, Mad Jack, magic, magic, magic. Get it? You're kind of a crazy guy. Magic, <laughs> Mad Jack. And I am getting oh pissed off. I mean, I am I'm getting so like, what the hell are you guys about? 
Yeah. It was, you know, it was just nuts because they want to be involved and they're not that creative themselves. So they got to make up no. something so that when you become this big hit, they go, oh, that was me. I, I was the guy that. that said to call him Magic. <laughs> or Matt Jack. Of course. Or Tommy Rainbow or whatever it is. So right. for my, we're just about to release the album and I come down for my final image meeting dressed in a suit of armor. And I said, Jesus Christ. I, and I walk in with, and it's got actually a visor and a plume feather, and I'm carrying a mace and a shield, and I'm entirely. Oh I, had, I rented this from, from a film studio. And we go, and there's the dogs now. They're, they're, they're the same thing. They were they were barking at me, saying, you know, you can't enter the, can't enter the, yeah, <laughs> the uh, the room with the suits. And I said to them. Guess what? My name is Tommy Armour. And I always wear armour, even on the radio. Wow. I thought they would get Monty Python humour, but they didn't. They, mm. they just couldn't see it. And they dropped me from the label. They said he doesn't take his image meeting seriously enough. Mm, that, that's enough to do it, yeah. <laughs> Oh but I don't God. care because I've got a system. And I just say, all right, well, I'll, I will manifest another record deal. Right. And in four or five months, I attract the attention of Bell Records because they see me doing a gig in a scuba diving outfit with, with tanks on the back. And, and like you do, you know. Yeah. Um, and they sign me. And now they've changed Amazing. my name to Arlen with oh, an God. R. And look how cute Nothing I wrong look. with Alan. <laughs> look at that. Very That's cute. nice, isn't it? It's a lot Very of hair. Handsome. A lot of hair. Yeah. And so, but I won't go into the reason why they dropped me, but basically I was kind of a pretty, I was very hard to work with. I was, what's the word? Um, an arsehole. That's it. I was... <laughs> I, I couldn't let okay. anybody do their job. And I was always uh, poking my nose into the, the, you know, why are you putting yeah. sound like that? And the engineer. And I, I was a control freak. So they dropped me. But I don't care. I've got a system. Yeah. And now I go for the big guns. And I'm literally sitting in my flat in London, looking towards New York, manifesting every night seeing myself sign a deal with clive davis of arista records wow and within three months i sign a deal with clive davis and now my name wow. is Colin and green with an e on the end now what a target what an amazing instinct you had for this at at such a young age man it took well by now most I'm of like, us oh, lo oh. much longer to figure this out <laughs> well so, so now the story gets really, really cool because Clive Davis is Clive Davis. And to those of you who don't know, he's still alive today and he's still like the most powerful person in, in the record business, almost. I mean, I'm sure he's he's probably in his late 80s or 90s or something like that now. But yeah. he's still kicking and he's awfully influential. And he, he was known as the man who never fails in the business. And he discovered Whitney Houston and, and Simon and Garfunkel. And oh, he claims to have discovered everybody, of course, you know. But he pretty much did, you know, a lot. Yeah. So I'm with him and you don't say no to Clive Davis. But Clive Davis says to me, I signed you. He says, because, you know, I saw your show and it's great. But he says, you haven't written any hit records yet. And I said, I said, well, that's because you haven't released any yet. <laughs> yeah. And he said, well, OK, he says, well, write me a hit record. And yeah. so I got re I got really determined. I said, "Well, he thinks I have all of all of the demos he's heard are not hits." So I went home and wrote three songs that weekend, and one of them, and I demoed them all. And one of them was a deliberate um, joke hit record. I mean, it, mm. it was a clear template. It was it was a hit right. record. There's no doubt it would be a hit, but it wasn't something that I wanted to record because it was a teeny bop right. song. So I hope you can right. hear this clearly. I'm going to play it part of it because it's part of the story. You have to understand. It literally okay. go it starts like this. Can I be a steady guy? 
by now and I'm writing a song about falling in love with a girl who will soon so it was be a joke. it was obviously a joke 15. right of course it was a joke it right. was a complete joke Clive hears it and he goes that's it that's your hit record and I went no no oh no. My God. no 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 you don't get no you don't get it I that, that was a joke you know 15 uh, first of all it's yeah. illegal and <laughs> And, and secondly, oh my God. I'm, you know, I'm in the mid, my mid twenties. I can't be singing teeny bop songs. Yeah. Listen to some of my other stuff. Now my manager said, don't, but the, don't ruin this. It's Clive Davis. You right. can't tell him you're not going to record it. Record it. Just record it. He'll hear all the other stuff in on the album and he'll get over this and he'll say, oh yeah, okay. This, this one's much better. Release that, you know, whatever. So I went along with it and I recorded it and it gets worse. I mean, it, it, the verse carries on. Your parents say I'm not you, but they don't know me like you're going to do. They don't seem to think young love can be true. Right. True as the night and the stars in your eyes and as true as I'll be to you, b -b -b baby, you'll soon be 15. And I'm cringing recording it. And I'm thinking, I can't do this. I, it's not, you know, so we end up working a year on this album like i did on all the, the other each of the other record label things and and we get to the end and they're going to do a big launch and i i just can't stomach it because he still says yes yeah. that's that's your hit which i can't do yeah but, yeah I and understand. so what i did it's was a late at night as a now, joke you know <laughs> it's a complete it's a complete joke. but it was a very obvious formulaic hit song they could have given it yeah. to the Bay City Rollers who were on their roster at the time, and they would have had a hit. They were the young kids in, in, in Scottish kilts, and, you know, they were 19. They could sing a song like that if they changed it to 16, maybe, you know. But, no, it's yours, and this is what you're going to release, yeah. and it's going to be your hit. So, late one night, I'm in the studio, and I in those days, we were recording on 24 tracks. So again, people today don't really understand what that is. There's, that is, they've got multi-track recorders in their own homes, in their garage, in their bedroom. But in those days, it was very expensive to be in a studio and we're recording on, on tape and it's 24 tracks. And what you had to do if you wanted to add more was bounce tracks together, save them somewhere else. So I said to the engineer, because the producer had fallen asleep by this time, he's snoring in, wow. the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the engineering room. And I say to my, my co-engineer, who becomes my best friend, James Guthrie. He ended up doing the uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall and everything from, from there on out. He, he's, he's, he's a great guy and we're still great, great friends. So I say to James, I say, please, can you bounce some all these backing, ba backing vocals? I did all my own backing vocals, all the harmonies, triple tracked everything. I said, put them aside, don't lose them, but I want to put some replacement back, backing tracks on. He goes, OK, and then we spend a couple of hours totally duplicating the backing tracks instead of singing. Baby, I was singing right. chicken noises. I went. Oh my God. In harmony, triple tracked to replace all the background vocals so that Clive would hear it and get that it was a joke. So yeah. here's. Literally, we end up with this. No one will come between us. I hold that group. But, 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 but,
Needless to say, he didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> you don't take your Clive Davis meetings seriously enough. And I'm dropping. You're out of here, me. buddy. Wow. Well. Wow. We could stop sharing for a moment, and I'll, I'll and then I'll go back into the sure. second half of this. I mean, isn't that you know? That's just typical of the industry. They had spent yes. well over a million dollars on recording this album. They could have, sure. he could have easily given that song to, as I say, the basic rules or somebody else and yeah. recorded some of my other stuff, which was really seriously good, <laughs> if not as commercial. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, but no, he got, it was a bee in his wow. bonnet. And, oh, it was just, no, you can't. So he dropped me and that album would never come out. And I, I had one more incident then where I, so now I'm a free entity. And I'm going to go and try to push. And I had what's called a white album of it, you know, an acetate of the album as it was going to come out. It was never going to come out because Clive has now said, nope, no way. And I, I'm walking, I, I'm deciding that I've got to go to America because what was happening mm -hmm. at the time was the Sex Pistols and total mm -hmm. punk rock. And that's not what I write. And I, I write melodies and tunes right. and you know so i go to america so i'm going to share screen again so what happened when i i literally i come to america and i don't know anybody i come and i'm sleeping on the couch of a friend in in la and so i go to all the record deals record companies rather i go to all the record companies that i know are in business in la which is is a lot all these and I'm showing off yeah. my Arista album that is not going to come out and I'm playing it as a demo. And every single one of them. I mean, I spent about two months doing this, going, getting meetings with all of these record labels, every single one. Oh, this is great stuff. Yes, we'll call you. Yes, we'll call you. Oh, this is fabulous. Terrific. No one, no one calls back. Why? Because Clive Davis is so powerful. Because Clive, yeah. Yeah. So every single one of them, their, their ears are closed. And there's one left that's called that was just launching called Planet Records. And it was Richard Perry, one of the most successful producers in the world. He had produced everybody, Rod Stewart, Carly Simon, Ringo Starr, you know, Donna Summer, Leo Sayer, mm -hmm. Diana Ross, Nielsen, you know, Barbara Streisand, Art Garfunkel, mm -hmm. everybody, The Temptations. He even, he even recorded Ella Fitzgerald, for God's sake. And I, I, I hadn't been there. So I end up finding out where he lives in this big mansion in Beverly Hills. And I wait outside the tennis courts for his friends to be leaving the gates open. And I walk in. I'm basically breaking into his property. And I walk up to the front door and ring the bell. And he answers. And he's standing there and I'm saying, oh, like, oh, I'm sorry. I know this is the wrong way to do this. I, I love your stuff. Oh, I love your stuff. Nielsen Schmielsen, fabulous. Oh, I shouldn't do this, but please, I'm really good. Would you please listen to this album? It was recorded on Arista. I, I was dropped from Arista, but you'll like it. If you will, please just listen to it. And he said something like that and said, get out. Yeah. <laughs> this is the wrong way I'm to do sure. this. Yeah. And so I was at the end of my tether because this system that I have now is not working, right? I'm using this system. Right. And all of a sudden it's broken and it's not working. Why is that? Something's wrong. There's something missing. And I had, by this time, I, I've exhausted my American Express card. In those days, they didn't know instantly that you had no money. That it would take a few days for it to yeah. you know, go through the banking system. I had a rental car that was due that I couldn't pay for. I had borrowed money from friends to come to America who believed in me, said, you go get another record deal, Alan, you're the greatest, you can do it, you know. And I, I was completely so out of money, completely out of patience and completely out of faith because my system was just now, I wasn't there at 90 to 95. I was completely down to yeah, hear sure. nothing. Everything had failed and I couldn't understand why. And this is when... This is fairly. A, this is a fairly typical story as well. But I'm driving back from going to visit a friend out <clears throat> in Chicago, 
to just get, you know get high and say I don't know what happened. Yeah. I, I and I've got to go back to Los Angeles and give this car back to the rental company and I, I, I it's not working. My system is is broken, it's dead. And I'm driving back. My friend gave me a gas card. <laughs> gave me a, a gas card so I could drive back and pay for the pay, pay for the petrol for the gasoline. I'm driving through Texas and I'm pretty down, but I'm not I'm not drunk and I'm not high. I'm not anything. I'm just depressed and I'm driving back to Los Angeles, assuming that I'm facing complete disaster. Yeah. And then it happens. And the divine speaks to you. You know, I mean, it, it happens to many people. You're at your lowest possible ebb. And I hear the voice mm -hmm. inside, the silent voice. And I know it's God. I know it, 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 there's no there's no question it's that time you know and what i heard was this alan when you're playing the piano uh for like 10 or 12 people and one person isn't paying attention you get really upset don't you <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, busted yeah pearls before swine why isn't that person listening? Mm. Why aren't they knocked out by wow. the great me? Right? That's how mm -hmm. I felt. And the voice simply said, and I'm driving, by the, by, bear in mind, and I'm on the freeway driving through Texas. And the hand passed across the windshield like this. And, and as the voice said, well, I'm playing this song all the time. In other words, all creation. And hardly anybody's mm. paying any attention. But I don't wow. get upset. In fact, I have infinite yeah. patience and infinite love for you. Keep playing, yeah. It's just because that's how I am. I mean, I'm in, I'm in complete darkness, as it were. And yet the moment yeah. that happened, the, the moving across the windshield of a giant hand, everything changed everything became electrified and i was thrown into what i can only describe as unity consciousness and i was one with everything wow i could see the sap in the trees i could see stars in the in the noonday sky i could see electrons in the sp steering wheel i was utterly shattered into this 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 bliss and this voice saying, you think you are manifesting all this and you've got this system and you've never once given any thought to where this power is coming from and it, mm. or asked me to be manifesting with you. Now, it gets tricky because, of course, it's both. Yeah. You are the divine. Mm. I knew that at the time. I knew it so clearly. I was thrust into this consciousness. And I'm driving slower and slower and slower, of course. I'm, mm. I'm literally like 10 miles an hour on the freeway and I have to pull over because the bliss is too overwhelming. I'd never felt anything remotely like it ever in my wow. life. I didn't know it existed. And I fell out of the car onto the, onto the side of the, of the freeway and fell on the grass. Mm. And the moment I just fell into the grass and I said, you know, I surrender. I surrender. I can't do it without you. And I'm asking you, you know, and I just said, I surrender. And at that moment, another plane crossed and made a cross right over my, over my, over my head. Wow. And I, I just, I went, I got back in the car and sat there for a while and the voice just continued, you know, do you mean to say that the being that is doing all this, and now I'm seeing everything, I, I won't exaggerate and say it was cosmic consciousness, I wasn't seeing galaxies, yeah. and, but, but I mean, I'm utterly one with everything I can see and I know the truth, that I mm. am it as we all are, 
Mm -hmm. There's no difference. You are the whole consciousness. So this was made manifest to me, and it, it was it was grace. It was a, it was just grace. Mm -hmm. So do, do you mean to say that the being that is doing all this can't get you a record deal? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> ow! The entire moment changed from utter nothing, no no positive thought at all. Amazing how fast up that happens, up right? And up and up and up and up to this point of, you might say, it's 99%, and yet it clicked over. 100% positivity, because the question seems so ludicrous. Do you mean to say, I can't get you a record deal? The divine? Ask me. Ask me. And I've surrendered, you know, and I say, yes, I, yeah. 100%, I'm in the now. I'm I tried to find a negative mm -hmm. thought in my whole mind, my body, my heart. I couldn't find it anywhere. It made no sense to say it can't happen because this was an assurance beyond anything. I'm doing all this. I can't get you a deal. Of course I can get you a deal. Just ask me. So everything disappeared. I was out of time. Time had gone. The idea of positive and negative had gone. The idea of 100%, 0% had gone. I was just in this eternal now. And I knew. And the voice said, what do you want? And I said, you know what I want? I want, uh, I want a record deal. Okay, done. What else do you want? Like, what? Done, yes. And I knew it. It was manifested. At that moment, 100%, the system works. If you can get to that 100% mark. What else do you want? How much do you want? And I knew at that moment I could ask for a million dollars. It's only a, a bunch of zeros. But I didn't. I asked for what I needed. I made a quick calculation of what I owed my friends and what I would owe on the car and the, and the travel and all this. And how I said I want enough money to live a year writing this. I will write an album about this called I Surrender. I asked for $60,000 advance. Mind you, this is 45 years ago. It's a lot of money. But $60,000, that's what I needed. Okay, done. What else? And we talked all the way back to Los Angeles. <laughs> and I, 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 I was in that state all the time and I just it was just blissful shimmering light and I remember driving back into Los Angeles and seeing a bank and I couldn't understand what a bank was I couldn't grasp why would you need a bank I have this bank in my heart and all I need to do is ask and it is given to me I saw an insurance company and I couldn't understand what it was. It made no sense to me. And I, I why would I, I have all the assurance, assurance in the world that I need. And I get back to the place that my friend whose couch I'm sleeping on. <laughs> and I sleep the best night's sleep I've had in months and months and months, right? And I, and I can remember thinking as I drifted off to sleep, please be still here when I wake up. Please, please don't go. This feeling, please don't go. And I slept well and I woke up and it was still there. <sighs> And the phone rang and my friend was out. So I answered the phone and it was Richard Perry. And he said, yesterday I heard your album. I can't remember word for word. He said something like it's some of the best stuff I've heard in a long time. I would like to discuss a record deal. Come to my house. You know where I live. Because oh. <laughs> I'd broken into his home. 
Uh huh. And I got a record deal. And do you know how much they gave me in an advance? <laughs> yeah, sixty thousand dollars. That's that's an incredible, incredible story. My God, that's uh, such a, a, a unique and powerful experience, and so so validated. And so I'm so glad you shared it, um, because everybody needs to understand that this is an innate human ability. And and the part that was missing for you is, you know, I feel like that people run into that often. You know, you. You got to understand that it's, it's not just you and it's not just God, but you are working in this incredible tandem, right? I mean, but if you don't acknowledge it and understand it, then you will get lost. So and you're not, you're not fit to be, to be continuing yeah. with it was the message I got. You know, yes, it's real and you've been using it, but we we now need to be partners in this <laughs> because there's really mm -hmm. no difference you need to understand the truth it is you yes. but you used to feel that you were somehow superior to others i am that i am is the message i am i'm it i'm the whole thing but so are you so is everyone in the room everyone mm -hmm. in the world everyone in the universe it's that knowledge that oh it, we're all divine and now i can write music that is is not the baby you'll soon be 15. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Not that that was, that was typical of my stuff at all, but, but now I can, and I spent the year writing that album and, and they released the single I Surrender and it was a hit, a small hit. It wasn't a huge hit. Uh, it was yeah. number one in a couple of places, but overall it was uh, number, it was in the top 30 of the Billboard charts. Uh, and then, and I won't go into why, because it's, it's a mystery, but it was all divine providence anyway. They dropped me, even though they had a hit record and I was not being mm. difficult to work with at all. In fact, I Surrender became my touchstone, my, yeah. my mantra. I would surrender to everything, whatever whatever's going on. I, I surrender my own idea of, oh, I know best, you right. know, because I well. knew that I don't always know best. And perhaps what you're giving me now is better than what I'm wanting. And that's yeah, what, and perhaps what Providence had a had had a had higher aspirations for you than, you know, a lucrative record deal, and I, I think that that's, oh, I, I would know, be dead now if I, if I, I, yeah, I'd be dead know. if I'd become famous back then. I I would have, with my uh, addictive personality and, and everything. Yeah. I I wouldn't have survived in the in the rock. That's the other world. thing that people have to remember, and, and that is that sometimes things happen that seem to go against our path or be obstacles or, you know, and, and, but we have to remember that, you know, our path is set out before us, not just by what we can perceive in, in this moment, but by a greater path, you know, a soul path. And, and oftentimes what we think is, Oh God, the worst thing that could ever happen ends up becoming the greatest thing, you know, that could ever Absolutely. happen very often. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. so that you know, was, I, that I, I want to take us Alan because I, I, you know, I, I, I want to get into um, hmm. some of the most amazing, remarkable things without getting to like so the, the the incredible show that you have on Gaia um, and where you've come to with this you know this the incredible encryptions that you found that is that's that's a lot and I, I want to I want to finish with that but I want. I, <laughs> I want to get it. I, I, I can't have you skip over this incredible experience you had in 2004, you know? Um, yeah. Although we can't, I don't want to spend too much time with it, but you know, my audience is very attuned to, you yeah. know, um, the extraterrestrial and how connected we are and how much they're trying to do for this human race. And I, and I talk about it a lot. And so I, I would love for you to, to go into that and then, Let's go into without getting too bogged down. Um, some of the unbelievable um, codes that you have come into deciphering, and this great revelation that is coming, um, <clears throat> hopefully on a global scale. And I also can't have you skip, you know, because 
the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians are two secret societies, at, you know, particularly the Freemasons at the upper echelon of it that have now gotten kind of, um, you know, a, a very bad name in a lot of ways and not for, it's not for nothing that they have come into that. Now, obviously 90, I think 95% of Freemasons are like you and I, and they don't really know about what has transpired at the upper echelons of this, of this secret society. But I would love to know what you think about, uh, because you've really kind of gotten gotten into it and gotten familiar with it, and you've cracked this incredible code, which doesn't surprise me. Run, you know, is a, is free free Masonic in nature, sure. and dates back to the Rosicrucians. So I would love to get into some of that, but we can't skip this this visit you had in two thousand four. No, so let's sure. start there. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, if you don't mind, I'll give you one, two sentences that just wrap up the Davy Jones story, because I, otherwise that makes no sense. Sure. Why did I start by telling you how I hate Davy Jones? As soon as I had my hit record um, uh, and, and got dropped, um, I get a call for a gig. It's secretive. They don't tell me what it's about. They want you to just go and uh, whip this band into shape. They're very good. They can play, but they can't read charts very well. And they need somebody to teach them the charts. And I go along to this gig and I'm teaching this band these charts. And they're playing well, and we have about 45 minutes into it. And all of a sudden, at the end, it's in a theater. And at the, I look towards the back, and in, in through the doors at the back end of the theater walks Davy Jones of the Monkeys, and it's the guy that I hate, right? For no reason. Oh 20 years God. ago. He walks in, and, and, and I'm going, and my stomach churned again. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. I, I, oh, it's that guy, right? No reason. Wow. Just. And he comes up to me and he calls everybody, he used to, he's, he's passed now, he used to call everybody cowboy. And he comes up and he starts right in with the Manchester stuff. He goes, hello, cowboy, how's it going? I hear you're from Manchester, just like me. Hey, do you know that pub down road on Oxford Street where Ina Sharples used to be? And he, and he starts doing all Manchester humour. And I'm gradually, within a couple of minutes, liking him and then feeling, I'm laughing myself silly because he's so funny. Yeah. He was one of the funniest person that people I've ever known. He could make you hurt wow. from laughing. And and so I start riffing back to him and I'm making him laugh and he's falling about. And the two of us are falling about laughing in this theater after about 10 minutes of just meeting. The band are standing around yeah. going, what the hell's going on? Are we rehearsing or what? And he says to me, yeah, you're coming on road with us, aren't you? Oh, it'd be great. You and me together, two Manchester lads, two handsome looking men. And he's, he's, the, wow. he's the pop star. He's the biggest star in the world, or was at the time, right. and he's asking me to come on the road with him. And I literally found myself saying yes. And the re and I two days later, I was on the road with him as his musical uh, director. So I just wanted to wow. wrap that up because what was I given? What was I given as a result of wanting that fame? It was denied yeah. me, but I got to experience it vicariously by being with him for 12 years on the road and seeing what a miserable life that is to be wow. utterly known that you can't walk out in the street without being mobbed. Even then, years later, they were doing the 20th anniversary tour. Yeah. I wrote a book about it. It was a big bestseller. They did a 25th anniversary tour. I wrote a book about that. That was another big seller. It won awards. I got to experience it without having to live it. That was probably mm. the greatest gift that the divine gave me. Yeah. You thought you wanted this. Look how it is. And that churning <laughs> in my stomach, I, re I began to realize we lived together in a little cottage in England. And I used to be wow. meditating in my room for like four or five hours. And I'd come out and I'd be in bliss. And I'd walk into the kitchen and there he would be. And my stomach would start churning. And I realized, oh, that's how he feels mm. all the time. Wow. It wasn't wow. my feeling. And I was picking that up when I saw him on television 20 or more yeah. years previously. So that, that's, that wraps that up. So we come to 20, 2004. I'm 55 years old and I'm praying to leave. I don't like it here anymore. I've, I'm saying to God, wow. I've done everything. I was on five record labels. You gave me my hit. You gave me my little tiny hit. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and I got to experience to go. fame vicariously without having to be the victim of it. All right. Mm -hmm. And I mean that because that's how white celebrities gravitate to other celebrities. They're the only ones yes. that can understand each other. What a weird life this is, you know. Yeah. 
And I was praying, I, I, you can take me. My daughter's off and running and she's fine. I just, I don't want to stay here, but I have a feeling there's something still I'm supposed to do, but you've got to tell me what it is or I just want, I just want to go. Yeah. So two weeks later, I'm in my, my bedroom in uh, my apartment in Los Angeles, which is this very room where I am right now, which is now a green screen studio. And I'm lying in bed reading a book and all of a sudden the energy goes very electric and shifts into a shimmering sort of, <gasps> whoa, 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 what is this? And I was paralyzed. I couldn't move and I'm looking straight up in bed like this. And I was aware of three extra dimensional beings floating into the room. I couldn't see them because I'm paralyzed looking upwards like this. Yeah. But they came to either side of my head here and another one further down out of sight that way. I immediately called them on my, well, my the, the, the teachings I follow, uh, since since I got yeah. that that list that lasted for four months, and I went looking for it, I finally found it. I don't proselytize; yeah. it's not a question. Of, you know, I don't say everybody should do this, but I found my own guidance, my my own guru. So I called on my guru. My guru was there instantly and filled me with non FDA approved bliss uh, by basically being <laughs> literally anesthetized me. <laughs> so here you go, yeah. and I was in. I was in immense bliss again. So I, I knew everything was okay. And I could feel these beings yeah. talking to each other in a language I didn't understand. It was very electrical sounding, mm -hmm. sort of. Right. And then they would they started to drill into my brain. Now, it, it wasn't painful. It was very pleasant. I don't mean drill like a Black & Decker drill. It was a it right, was spiritual right. surgery. <laughs> but something went inside and was doing something. I didn't know what. And then they withdrew and then they floated out and my guru left and I was able to move again. And I thought, what on earth was that? No idea. Yeah. And it happened two weeks later, exactly the same, except this now, now I knew. I was like, oh, they're here again. Ooh, and I'm paralyzed. And they yeah. gave me an upgrade, I, I assume. I don't know what. Uh, maybe they put 2.8 in and I needed 3.2. I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but they did something more and then that happened a third time two weeks later now bear in mind i had just prayed tell me what i'm here for yeah and i got these three spiritual surgeries yeah and then two weeks after that i was introduced to the shakespeare work by a friend of mine who said well i'm doing a one-man show will you come and support me and i said yes of course like you always would to a friend and I said, what's it about? Yeah. And he said, it's about Shakespeare. And I went, oh, oh great. Because yeah. I had no interest. <laughs> great. I had no interest in Shakespeare my whole life. Yeah. None at all. It was dead oh. to me. I was not the least bit interested. But I went to his show. Oh, and sure. in 10 minutes, he wasn't talking about codes. He was talking about the basics. The man from Stratford, they were all told, is the man who was the writer, Shakespeare, never traveled anywhere and yet half the plays are written in italy and other countries and he knows them like mm -hmm. the back of his hand there are no manuscripts the original manuscripts have all disappeared there's no play not a poem not a sonnet not a page not a line not a word in the original hand of the original author that just seems wow. very suspicious the greatest very writer suspicious. in the world never wrote a letter to anyone what he never wrote a what Never wrote a letter to anybody. And above all, most mystifying of all, contemporaneously at that time, no one ever saw him. No one ever said, oh, I was really? at the pub, uh, the pub last night and there was Bill and he was writing a scene from Macbeth. No one ever saw the man. And yet he had the greatest career, 25 year career in, in, the, in, in London at the time. It would have been like being a cross between Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise and J.K. Rowling all rolled into one and no one ever saw him. So this was the basics of his talk, my friend's talk. And I went, oh my God, that's what I'm here to. This is an amazing story. I'm going to write it as a musical because that's what I am. I'm a musician and I was going to write it as a musical. And I started <laughs> the next day researching and I honestly, I joke, I've never, I haven't had a day off since, and it's been 19 years, 19 and a half years now. 
<laughs> but at first I wrote it as a musical and then I wrote it as a book and then I was writing it as a mini series and then I, and then finally I realized wait a minute there's codes involved and I've never been yeah trained in cryptography and I've never been trained in deep mathematics and I've never been trained in in geometry but I understood it all mm -hmm. oh that might be something to do with the yeah <laughs> the ETs. Those drills. And I, I <laughs> so um, I started to be able to decode and decode and decode. So um, that's, I mean, that's bringing us up to par, except that you don't have any concept of what these codes are. So, I mean, of course, I would like yeah. to say, you know, visit my, my website to be or not to be dot org. It's not numbers. It's not a Prince song. It's the way he wrote it as words. <laughs> www. Right. To be or not to be. org or go and see the Gaia series. I mean, first of all, everyone who's 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 watching and listening, you, you, particularly if you are, you know, like I, you know, I, I've, I've, I'm classically trained to to read and speak Shakespeare, and and uh, it was one of the things that I really came into um a, lo a lot of passion for wow. because of the power okay. of his words and uh yeah. and 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 so shakespeare even as an actor needs to be decoded the iambic tells you not only the story as it's written on the page but mm -hmm. it tells the actor how what state the character is in it's you know shakespeare it's not like modern plays where you you read a character description. It's like a page long. That was in the text, and so Shakespeare yeah. always has required decoding for actors who truly want to be good at speaking his his incredible verse and and mm -hmm. his lines. But um, fascinating to me that that so it doesn't surprise me at all that 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 there is so much more to the code because. You, when you start really learning Shakespeare, you learn that it's all encoded in one way or another. So the, I, I can't recommend um, Alan's show enough for anyone who's interested. Most people who follow me, I think, you know, have succumbed to my recommendations and and sub, and got a Gaia uh, for subscription. So it's it won't be much um, trouble for them to to check out this show while they're sure. while they're watching. Um, if they want to know but, where. If they want to know where, yes. it's my website. To, and then when you just click on the website, the landing page it has a big red button there saying, here's the Gaia show. So you just you just click on it there. But um, yeah, uh, of course, it's a different kind of encoding. You're right. It's encoded mm -hmm. in a certain way to give, to deliver all kinds of information as to how uh, how to pause, how to breathe through the ambic yes. pentameter. All that. And that's that's a skill all its own. Um, and in a way, it is a it is an encoding. But this coding that I'm talking about is is absolutely uh, mathematically provable. In other words, it's uh, it's just that I I could recognize that if you see, um, again, we won't go into how, but literally, let's say his gravestone, the man from Stratford, his he was born Shakespeare. His name is Shakespeare. It doesn't have an e in it. Doesn't have the the long sounding shake. But nevertheless, it's it. So we call him Shakespeare. The real author is hiding behind the mask, I, I believe, of that of that person, and so it's 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 a mask. He's playing a game with us, and I I want to stress more than a game. It's it's it is that it's like that in nature because there are codes that are hidden in the gravestone, in the monument, in the sonnet's dedication, in certain speeches, and the way it's hidden is just. Let's take a, any say, take the well-known speech of to be or not to be. That is the question, right? And you look at the speech and you take it out literally from the original and place it on a page and you simply put it into a grid. That means take a certain number of letters of characters, including punctuation, of, and take it to that point and then wrap it around and again and again and again and again. And if it makes mathematical sense, in other words, it ends up in a perfect square or rectangle, you might then look for certain symbols and the, the symbols that you see and the hidden message is vertically inside the grid. And so you're looking for 
well, there's a message. It becomes very, very clear. And so if you watch the show, you'll understand that. But on that level, it gets to be really, that's the incomprehensible nature of it. Not only did he write this, these most wonderful, endearing, eternal works. I mean, they're still popular today, 400 years later, even though we don't fully understand even the arcane language, you know, we still get the feeling. Uh, and yet he's also hiding messages within certain key speeches, certain key documents, certain key monuments and the gravestone, etc, etc, that are telling you who he really is and why there was a cover up. And it's not just me saying that, because after about six to seven years of initially working on it, I could prove to you if I showed you like 15 minutes of a presentation, but it, you'll see it in the shows. Oh, that this is genuine. And it, it leaves a code yeah. that says specifically something. And what it says is, I've left the answer to what you want about why there's a mystery, why there were no manuscripts, why my whole life was covered up. It's hidden in a certain place. And that certain place is, is the altar stone inside Holy Trinity Church, where Shakespeare of Stratford, the man who never traveled anywhere and yet knew all of Italy like the back of his hand, it's hidden there in an altar stone. Well, that's just me saying that unless I can prove it. And so I, one of the things you will right. learn from the show is that I literally went to Stratford, engaged with them. I, I had to nurture them for about four years and six mm -hmm. visits where I, w I helped them uh, raise money for certain functions and things like this. And I became their friend. And ultimately, they gradually allowed me to film uh, in inside the mm -hmm. church in places that normally you're not allowed to go, i.e. back towards the altar stone, which is right. protected by a forensic system that sprays you with a chemical if you're there, uh, if you're not invited. You know, so if you come in to break right. in, you're going to get sprayed and the chemical will stay on your body or your clothes for 12 months. There's a sign outside saying, don't wow. risk it. Don't risk it. You know, 100% conviction right. rating for it. Plus, they've got 24-hour CCTV cameras. So I had to overcome the forensic system and the TV cameras in order to get to this altar stone and radar scan it. And in the show, I tell you how I did that. Because <laughs> I was able to radar scan it. And then from radar scanning it, the altar stone, which is nine foot long, three foot wide, two feet deep, it should have a tiny little hole in it. You should see in the scan. It should be all gray for the stone. And there should be a tiny little place that indicates a reliquary, which is it's a, it's a Roman Catholic uh, Holy of Holies altar stone. And it has to have this little place where Rome sends over bones of a saint or pieces of their writing and they're hidden inside. And that makes it consecrated. And it would show up as a little hole. But as you'll see on the show, that whole one side radar scanned it is 250 times the size it's supposed to be. It it's is huge. not a tiny it's little immense. hole. Yeah. It's enormous. And you can see different levels in it. So that proves the authenticity of the codes. It proves that, oh, OK, the system that I had discovered is true and genuine. And it shows you that there is something there. All you have to do is now convince the church to open it in full view of the world's media and the public. And that's my effort now. I'm actually going to Stratford next week to talk to the church about this. But I mean, this is a long time How is ago. How's the effort going? Well, right now yeah. it's not. It's this is not almost. Going anywhere, but it will. I mean, in <laughs> other words, here's the here's the thing. Stratford uh, exists on on the myth of their man, the man who was born in Stratford, being the true Shakespeare. If he's not, well, they don't want to find out what's in that altar in case it tells you who it really was, and then it turns out to be not their guy. On the other hand. It's not as simple as that. Their guy is tremendously important it, it, because it's a, what the what the bard, as we call him in England, has left us is this magnificent puzzle to find out who I truly am. Right. Find out who this is. Oh, it's a treasure hunt. It's a game. It's a it's a puzzle. 
Hamlet says in in one section, uh, undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns. You know, he's talking about that. It says puzzles the will, but all the codes have to be read forwards and backwards. So what that puzzles the will says is really wills the puzzle. The actual identity of will, the the the, the author is the puzzle, and it's a puzzle. It truly is. Yeah, it's a game. And once you understand that. The way I end the Gaia series I, is I just say, look, it's as simple as this. He's saying in one of the sonnets, he says, I am that I am. Well, that's the name of God given by Mo, given to God, given by God mm-hmm. to Moses on Mount Sinai. Echye, Ashe, Echye. I am that I am. It's the name of God. But King James issued an edict in 1606 forbidding the use of the name of God. You cannot use it. You cannot say it. You can't say Jesus Christ. You can't say Holy Trinity. You can't say I am that I am. You can't, right? Under penalty of huge fines and then ultimately death. And yet he says it. How did he get away with that? If he was just the man from Stratford, it's not possible. He would have been a commoner. He would have been dragged. Yeah. He would have been tortured. He would have been burned at the stake. So instead, it's it's... It's as simple as this. I like to say, as I say at the end, to be or not to be. What does that really mean? He's simply saying he, he's an enlightened being. I mean, there's no doubt that the, the man who was the true author is in that state of consciousness. I would, I would hazard a guess to say it's cosmic consciousness. He's, he's an avatar. He's a great master. And he came to deliver this truth. But he's saying to be or not to be. We have a choice always to be or not to be who we truly are. You can be the I am that I am, or you can keep on wearing this mask and play all the roles you want. You can incarnate thousands, millions of times if you want, and just just be in the drama. And and that's fine, too. I like that. I wrote all these dramas. It's fine. We have an eternity to live in, you know. But you can be that. Or you can choose to take off this this communal mask of a Midsummer Night's Dream that we're all living, take it off and be who you truly are. So to be who you really are, or not to be, that is the question. We might as well start with the most mind-blowing system of all, a Shakespeare equation. In the sonnets, do a search on the word speed. It occurs only three times. Once in Sonnet 50, twice in Sonnet 51. Now, do a search on the word light. We multiply all the light sonnets, all the speed sonnets, and divide speed into light. Speed of light. It's a ratio, so it's like one-fourth of something. The answer at this point makes no sense yet. But I knew there had to be a key, even though I didn't know yet where this was leading. My intuition kept whispering, Pyramid. Pyramid. Since that's so important to Rosicrucian and Freemasonic philosophy, I looked and found the only sonnet that has the word pyramid in it is number one, two, three. Of course. One, two, three. It's obvious. So I multiplied by that. Still didn't ring any bells, but I was looking for the well-known speed of light number, which as we all know, is defined in meters per second. There's 299792458 meters per second, right? We all know that. Sure, I had to learn some advanced math and trig before it clicked. But all of a sudden I realized, oh, he must be working in ancient Egyptian measurements. Well, converting Egyptian royal cubits into meters turns out to be very simple. You just multiply by pi over six. So I did. And there it was, astonishing, the speed of light in meters per second to 99.84% accuracy. And it's not a fluke. And what proves it is that the system can be duplicated. On the left, you input the sonnet numbers that contain the words you're looking for. In the middle, multiply by what I've called the Shakespeare equation, 123 times pi over six. On the right will be the solution. For instance, two other really important astronomical values are the average distance Earth to Sun and Earth to Moon. Just fill in the blank spaces with the numbers of the sonnets that contain the word Earth and the numbers of the sonnets that contain the word Sun. Multiply by the number of the 
only sonnet that contains the word distance, 44. Take that result, multiply by the Shakespeare equation, 1, 2, 3 times pi over 6, and there it is. The average distance Earth to Sun, accurate to 99.994%. Here's the same process with the Moon sonnets, replacing Sun sonnets, accurate to 99.9%. .9%. Any questions? I have some incredible people on my on my show, and and I always love the 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 possibility of someone hearing something that they can immediately acclimate into again. their life that will allow them a greater expression. Oh, that I, that I freeze. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, I hear you again now. Yeah, it froze for about ten um, seconds. Okay, it still says it's uploading though, so um, it's probably all right. I wanted to give you. Yeah, it's this. This is the, the software is so choppy. I apologize, everyone who's stayed with don't us worry, so far. Don't worry, don't worry, uh, don't worry. It's not a problem. It's okay. I'll <laughs> gladly come back. Um, yes, we'll we'll do it again. But I would love for you to um, offer some parting wisdom um, to my to my audience and to everyone who sticks around to the end of my podcast okay. because I give people a chance to offer, um, you know, either a, a mantra or just a a few minutes of something that they would love to leave the audience with about this incredible life we have in this incredible universe. You know, I'm often asked, what is Shakespeare's ultimate message? Why, why would there be this mystery? Because it's clearly intentional. And I have been fortunate to be able to download these mysteries and, and bring certain incontrovertible truth to light because the validity of the codes was proven by my going to Stratford and radar scanning the Holy of Holies altar stone and finding that indeed the, where the code said you'll find that I've left something in there uh, it's absolutely true there's something in there there's, there should be a hole only this size and it's 250 times the size it should be and in fact I built a life-size replica of the altar stone that you can see on the Gaia show uh, to show we're like, whoa, what that really means. It's enormous, which of course means A, the codes were valid and B, there is something there waiting for us. Well, if we were to put that into uh, some other uh, way that we can understand it, let's say we knew where, well, we do know where Leonardo da Vinci last lived when he passed. And suppose you went into his apartment and scanned the wall and, and found, oh, wait a minute, there's a, there's a hole there. There's, a, there's actually a space, there's a false wall, there's a space of about a foot deep. You know, should we look in there or, nah, it's probably very moldy, let's not bother. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just nonsensical. You'd say, yeah, let's have a look, see if there's another painting in there. If you knew where Beethoven had died and you checked out his place and there's a false floor with a, with a oh, there's a place down in the, in the basement. Maybe that's where Beethoven's 10th is. <laughs> you know, should we look? Nah, let's not bother. We've got the same situation at the church at Stratford. I have proven that there's something there that he left. His last wish was a prayer. His last wish was a prayer saying, please look inside the altar stone. I have left the proof of why there was an in immense cover up and why there are no manuscripts. Should we look? Nah, let's not bother. <laughs> right. So that's that's my job right now to convince the church that it's a beautiful thing, that they've got an opportunity to open it and show the world what the greatest writer in the world left for us. But I can already tell you what the message is because I, I put it at the very end of the Gaia series. It's simply this, his greatest, his greatest message was to be or not to be, and that is misunderstood or regarded to be what it is. It's, oh, he's, commit, he's wondering should he commit suicide or not. But on the ultimate level, he's left us what I can only describe as a scripture. And he actually wrote in the sonnets, I am that I am, which is the name God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, the holy name of the divine. And of course, we all know the truth is we all are the I am that I am. And that's the mystery. And that's the message that is it, that we've got this mask 
of the man from Stratford who was said to be the author and the truth hiding behind that mask. I believe it's this writer named Edward de Vere. And de Vere in, is the Hebrew word for the Holy of Holies. It literally means the original root word of word, devar, was the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. It's the own vibration. When we have a creation, we get into duality. The first thing that happens is is vibration, word, om. Mm -hmm. That's what his name means. That's right. And via in Latin means truth. And the Holy of Holies itself, where the answer is, is the Hebrew name de Vere. So it's, it's a perfect metaphor. And he's saying, look, I'm hiding. De Vere is the truth hiding behind this mask. We are all wearing a mask. We're all mm -hmm. Shakespeare. We're all wearing this communal mask of our collective Midsummer Night's Dream. And we can keep on incarnating as mm -hmm. much as we want and play every role we want, just like Bottom does in Midsummer Night's Dream. He wants to do everything, right? And he says, that's fine, too. Yeah. I love drama. I wrote all these dramas. That's life on Earth. <laughs> just live it. Yeah. And if you yeah. do a million incarnations, what does it matter? You've still got an eternity left, right? It's that's nothing. Right. It's or you can take off that mask, yes. be who you truly are, the I am that I am. So when he says to be or not to be, he's saying we all have that choice to be who we truly are mm. and, and express that and speak it, speak that truth to the others of us who don't yet know yet yes. who we all are. And speak that truth or keep that mask or not to be. You can keep the mask on and keep on having fun. Right. Although sometimes it's not so much fun. So, you know, mm -hmm. it means your choice. Yeah. That's the message. It's a scripture. It's a very, very, it's very beautiful. It's all couched in terms of a beautiful. game, a puzzle to sort out. So that's what I believe yeah. he's he's doing. And, and, and uh, right now I consider my job to be to convince the church to open that altar and let us see what the, the great yes. writer's last wish was. So I'm heading there next uh, week to try to a, convince them of that. I can't wait to to touch back, to, to check in with you again and check on your progress and help you um, as much as I can because it's, a, it's, it's a noble and beautiful work that you have endeavored. And I'm so grateful for your time. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties. No I'm, I know Dorian is going to put it all together very well and we'll have to reconvene um and really yeah. get it get get into some of the more nitty-gritty and nuts and bolts of this incredible encryption that you have deciphered and my um great pleasure you're a beautiful soul alan i thank you so much for your time and uh well, I, I look forward to talking to you again me too thank you faust very very much i'll be back whenever thank you, you whenever you want i'll i'll be back awesome in stratford thank you shortly, we'll good luck in stratford Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.